and several museum shows uh-huh. around the country and outside the country and, and museum collections and she's done public art yeah so um in that one it was more formatted like i was asking her questions and then the we had Presentation by uh, Ambreen Butt, uh, who's exhibiting, one of the artists is exhibiting in the gallery along with Anila Kayam uh, Aga, Aga and Samin Farhat. And we are also having an interior gallery, an exhibition by Bill Viola, where we have a video installation that I hope you all get to see. Both of these exhibitions will be ending this Saturday, April 3rd. Um, before we get started, the gallery at UTA would like to thank the Art Bridges Foundation, Arlington Camera, the Art and Art History Department and students, uh, Abraham Lopez Ortega Design for their generous support of our exhibition schedule. I would also like to say that we will be taking uh, questions at the end of the uh, 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 conversation and uh, please su- you're welcome to submit those questions beforehand before we get to the end. And then we'll be asking Ambreen uh, those questions. Um, and I wanna talk a little bit about Ambreen's background. She received her BFA in traditional Indian and Persian miniature painting from the National College of Art in Lahore, Pakistan, and her MFA in painting uh, from the Massachusetts College of Art and Design in Boston. Uh, Her work has been featured in in solo exhibitions and institutions throughout the United States, including the Dallas Contemporary here, and has been the recipient of numerous awards and grants. Her work has been collected by numerous uh, public institutions, including the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Institute of Contemporary Art, also in Boston, uh, the Library of Congress in Washington, DC, Minneapolis Institute of Art, Minnesota, and the National Museum of, uh, for Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C. as well, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, uh, and the U.S. Art and Embassies Program in Islamabad, Pakistan, among others. She is represented by Gallery Wendy Norris in San Francisco, uh, where she had an exhibition about a, a year ago. Uh, so I'd like to introduce um, Ambreen, but so I'm going to take it over. Hey. Thank you very much, Benicio, and thank you for um, allowing um, this opportunity to share my work and my process with the broader audience uh, outside of Arlington uh, Gary Space. 
Uh, this is uh, my second exhibition since I've moved to uh, Texas in Dallas area. Uh, so um, I'm, you know, very excited and grateful for that. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen so that I can uh, show you my slides. Just, um, let me know if you can see it. Yes, I can see it now, and uh, you just want to get it full screen. Okay. Yep, there you go. All right, I'm going to move this little thing in the front so that I know I'm looking at the camera. All right, so um, um, thank you for the introduction. I guess I just don't have to go into the detail of uh, where I'm from or what I did, uh, but just a little bit background uh, about my practice. Uh, as uh, Benito mentioned that I was trained uh, first in the, uh, the traditions of indo pak and Persian miniature paintings, and then um, in the contemporary Western art forms in uh, my graduate uh, school um, in Boston. Um, so um, my artistic practice uh, incorporates and uh, negotiates both these traditions. Um, in the process of this negotiation, uh, a new vocabulary is generated for the elements of Western art, uh, reframing the tradition of miniature painting uh, by updating its technical and conceptual process. And uh, while I um, draw upon these traditions, uh, my work uh, consistently responds to the events within the contemporary political culture and the effects of those events in uh, individual on individual lives. Uh, so um, uh, to this, to my uh, work, I address issues of power, vulnerability, and uh, uh, investigate the hierarchies of social and political structures. Uh, as a global artist, I'm engaged in the explorations of multiple truths and questions of human rights, war, and violence. So um, I'm going to start today with this painting. Uh, it's untitled from the series Cirque du Monde. Um, that was done in 2007, and I had already been an artist uh, for almost 15 uh, years prior to, prior to making this work. Uh, up to this point, uh, the figure had been an essential element in my work. Uh, with my intense training as a miniaturist, it uh, just came very natural for me to think in images and create a narrative using the figures. Uh, I had a particular interest in the female heroine uh, from the uh, Mughal tradition of Indian uh, Persian miniature painting. And um, this has led me to create several series of works that address the historical representation of the female body in uh, this particular genre. So I crafted my own a protagonist uh, who was not an idealized figure uh, or a character, uh, seen and presented uh, through the gaze of a male artist, but rather uh, uh, it was a person seen through the gaze of a female artist. Uh, she is a mirror in which many women see their faces. So here our heroine is seen engaged in the acrobats in uh, a domestic uh, space. She seems to have cloned herself to fit the multiple roles. Uh, she's both the subject and the object for the viewer. Her never ending enthusiasm, ambitions and energy in, in pursuit of perfection is both astounding and onerous uh, for the eyes. Uh, let me see if I can change this. All right. Um, so um, her presence in my work uh, was not limited to the small manuscript style paintings. Uh, she had uh, come out of what uh, of that realm uh, like a warrior um, to the to face the world. Uh, here she is seen in a large scale mural at the facade of Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum uh, in uh, Boston. Um, uh, this was about I think a thirty six to forty feet tall mural that I painted. Um, um, it's actually painted and then uh, digitally printed uh, for the for the to to put it in the size. Um, 
right? So then, all right. Um, but this here, you see one of my studio walls from uh, 2008. Uh, this came about uh, after having lived in the United States for 12 years and then returning to Pakistan for a visit. Um, 2007 was the time of uh, General Pervez Musharraf's rule in Pakistan. He apparently held uh, the two most powerful positions in the country. He was the president as well as the chief of uh, the army staff. Uh, he used his authority to suspend the chief justice of the country which resulted in massive protests on the streets, primarily led by the lawyers and uh, the judges. So a state of emergency was declared uh, in the country and many activists were arrested. Uh, I happened to have uh, witnessed the, uh, the beginning of that unrest during my visit there. Uh, so I came back uh, to uh, the United States uh, with the images of uh, that unrest and um, you know, I would you know, read the news and uh, would cut out the images, you know, uh, from uh, the mass media and would pin them uh, on my studio wall. So later that uh, gave birth uh, to a series called A Dirty Pretty. Um, so uh, the series Dirty Pretty, uh, it was a small series, uh, the, uh, only a few paintings, uh, done on multiple layers of mylar and a, a set of prints that you will see uh, that are also um, you know, exhibited in the gallery right now. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that later. Um, so, right, just gonna find my notes about this piece. Uh, all right, so, um, So these, all these, uh, the whole Dirty Pretty series was uh, done on layers of mylar and uh, each layer has been cut and stitched, drawn and painted upon and then put back together. So um, uh, this and the next uh, piece uh, in the series, there are two large, uh, very large pieces. Uh, they call the Great Hunt and uh, they are made by layering and juxtaposing two kinds of images. Uh, one of the classical miniature painting, uh, the original Great Hunt, uh, and the images from the mass media that I had collected uh, of the protests and arrests of uh, people during uh, Musharraf's raid. So uh, the, the original, the classical 16th century Great Hunt uh, from v &A collection in London, uh, uh, which I think uh, was executed by Mansoor, shows the Mughal Emperor Akbar in a hunting scene somewhere near uh, today's Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, this exquisitely painted hunting scene shows Akbar and his trained cheetahs hunting the deers and gazelles. And um, uh, it is said that there was so much bloodshed in that field that it impacted Akbar immensely and he almost became uh, a different person encouraging peace through diversity. He even um, uh, you know, created a, a sect uh, called Deen Ilahi where he would encourage people from uh, uh, different religious backgrounds and, you know, come together. And um, so, um, so I juxtapose the imagery of the Great Hunt with the images from the President Musharraf's state of emergency uh, in a very symbolic way. It kind of reminded me of, uh, you know, you know, the Akbar's Great Hunt through that, um, uh, um, the the original painting uh, of the of the hunt uh, with the you know sort of like Musharraf being the you know the hunter and hunting down on um, uh, all the activists. Um, so you can see these details, uh, the outlined figures. You know these are the image has been taken from the mass media protests, um, but here they are drawn uh, with the thread and needle. So mylar is a very, uh, uh, it's a very hard surface as you know, you know that. So in order to stitch through it, I had to make holes with an awl to kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, do the drawing with the, with the thread and needle. So um, it's very, very uh, uh, meticulously done and uh, also very strenuous <laughs> to work on this, but just punching the hole, you know, in, in on the surface, was kind of, you know, it was sort of like a, a little painful process, but it kind of gave more uh, understanding 
and empathy of um, you know the situation that I was looking at through this image. Um, and uh, here are the other. So this piece is a big uh, diptych. It's actually uh, uh, in the collection of Cincinnati Art Museum right now. And uh, they, the the mylars are placed on uh, two large scale tea stained papers that I stain myself. And, uh, and then each layer of mylar is drawn upon and then, uh, you know, sometimes it is stitched and it's painted. And, uh, and then when all the layers are put together, they're eventually stitched together. You can see the stitching on uh, the right side of the, uh, the frame. Um, oh, how, many, how many layers do you? Uh, I think this had probably five layers of mylar. So uh, the materials I've used here is uh, watercolors, white gouache, uh, it's uh, 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 actually gold leaf and uh, thread. And um, it's very hard to work on mylar, to paint on mylar. So I kind of found, so through the process, I kind of learn and invent my own techniques uh, to, to kind of um, um, imitate the process of making a miniature painting because, you know, in traditional classical paintings, this is how we were taught. We would uh, work on several layers of, uh, we, uh, you know, would take away several layers of uh, either fine cotton or silk and then put them together, glue them together until we have a stable surface. And then the painting goes through uh, layers of these paints. And then, uh, um, you know, from, you know, starting from big marks to eventually moving to the smaller brush mark. Um, and so it's very similar process, but you know, of course, it had uh, uh, gone beyond uh, its uh, uh, traditional um, uh, realm, and uh, you know, started introducing um, the materials that uh, were available in or very popular in those time, like in 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 the in the two you know two thousand since since two thousand or since nineteen ninety nine. I think I've been working on mylar. So um, and. Uh, Here's another one. This is at uh, with the National Museum for Women in the Arts, and uh, this is actually Great Hunt One. Uh, uh, Great Hunt One. Uh, um, I did the diptych after I did this one, and um, so this sort of medallion. I mean, you can see the the works in process right now on the table uh, with all the layers and how they're painted, and uh, my references on the wall uh, for the images that are weaved into the work. Um, uh, with my own uh, imagery and uh, mark making. And in this detail, you can see that there are some on the left, there's some uh, uh, pieces of small collage, uh, text collage is uh, also buried in there. Uh, this was actually a poem that uh, uh, was written by a very famous poet from Pakistan, um, Faz Ahmed Faz. And here is a um, uh, detail of you know image of the protest from uh from that time uh and uh my use of that imagery in uh you know kind of blending in with my own uh you know into my own process so uh, the next uh, series, I mean, it's actually uh, called, this is a suite of five prints and that are actually uh, in the exhibition right now. Um, it's called uh, Daughters of the East. It's part of that larger series, Dirty Pretty. And um, uh, it was uh, uh, created in response to a specific incident, an incident in Islamabad uh, at uh, Lal Masjid, which is also known as the Red Mosque. Uh, that happened in 2007, uh, the same year of uh, the unrest when I was visiting back. Uh, generally, uh, you know, the, um, Lal Masjid uh, has been one of the oldest, it's kind of one of the oldest mosques in Islamabad and a conservative center of teaching for both men and women. Uh, the clerics of the Lal Masjid uh, uh, have often been in uh, conflict with the government administration. And in 2007, uh, there were a series of events that left uh, almost uh, 90 people dead and hundreds wounded, you know, it depends on the sources that you're following. So uh, the female students of the, of the Lal Masjid uh, were active in the protest and, uh, um, and, and my series of the sprints are based on uh, press images from that event, uh, one of which is this image. So in this image, 
which was taken from the mass media, a group of uh, women are seen wearing black burqas. Uh, they seem very threatening with bamboo sticks in their hands, uh, out in the streets acting as a moral police, uh, a police force charged uh, with keeping social order. Uh, the individual identities are subsumed by the group. In the image, they are unified by the black burqas and their strength is dependent on standing together and the gesture of false empowerment wielding uh, the bamboo sticks. It is uh, a threatening sight, uh, but it is, uh, it is the image, um, but it, you know, um, that's, if you bre break down the image into an to an individual person, uh, reality is contrary to what the image suggests. So majority of these girls are of a very, you know, in this photo are of a very tender age uh, and they belong to, um, you know, some unprivileged families, um, uh, but still very beloved to their, you know, families. And the, uh, so, so there is an element of delicacy, of sadness and vulnerability that isn't readily apparent in the, uh, to the viewer. The girls were highly influenced by the teachings of their madrasa and many died after a military sage to the mosque. So the first print in the series uh, juxtaposes two different iconographies, ladybugs and the image of clustered women in black. Each symbolizes, symbolizes delicacy and infestation uh, simultaneously. Individually, a ladybug is a symbol of good luck uh, while a colony of them uh, become something quite different and toxic. Uh, in the same way, the women are also young and delicate girls behind the black veil, but in a group, they portray a different image and have a different identity. Um, throughout the suite, the image, images are composed of systematic mark making, uh, celebrating the mundane practice of building images that inscribe a narrative. The narrative in this small series evolves against a background of the ladybugs. Um, they are meticulously drawn and crafted in the techniques of etchings, aquatint, and chincolet uh, to the height of its uh, perfection. So for instance, this one, uh, we've used uh, almost six uh, plates to, um, um, you know, to craft this image. Um, and <clears throat> And the lines, patterns, and marks on the surface are seen here in the reminiscence of the figure. Uh, it is illuminated with layers upon layers of etched drawings on six different plates. The gesture of the figure suggests as if she's trying to find her feet to lead uh, her own path. But all she gets is the spark of light in the midst of darkness, <clears throat> which um, eventually consumes her. Uh, erasing the traces of what is left of her identity. Um, okay. So in this last uh, piece of the suite, uh, the female in the black uh, have uh, reappeared unwilled. Behind uh, her vulnerable face is a world falling apart uh, as the turbans and police helmets circle and collide with each other. Uh, her bamboo stick is just a bamboo stick and not a weapon of wrath. The bird, a woodpecker, is a metaphor for the dissembling of reality. Uh, by showing the bird pecking on the bamboo stick, the meaning of the stick has changed from an image of empowerment into one of vulnerability. All right, so uh, here I'm shifting from uh, my uh, very figurative work to more of like a mark making work. And, um, you know, Right, so here, okay. Um, so my mark making is not limited to brush strokes or an etching tool, uh, as you can see now. Uh, it expands through a variety of media, such as torn pieces of paper or text when used in a drawing or hand casted small digits in a, a larger than life installation. <clears throat> so the use of torn text in my work began when I incorporated bits of my own journals into a larger drawing. Uh, the ritual of rejecting the written version of self-preserved in the journal and processing it into a new form, one which had to be read and interpreted in new ways, exposed the vulnerability of the written word and posed new questions about its meaning. Through this medium, I began to explore the ways of transforming text to create images that can be familiar yet untranslatable. 
<clears throat> the intent of the drawing is to compel the viewer to look at text not as a form to be read, but to be viewed and interpreted. <clears throat> um, pages of Deception. Um, this work is, uh, this was done in 2012. And it is formatted in a glorious manuscript style, two panels side by side, referencing an open page of a book, are filled with torn pieces of text that are glued on the surface. The particular text used in this piece is from the documents of a famous terrorism trial based in Massachusetts. The small bits of these fragments, uh, fragmented documents uh, from both the defense and the prosecutor are laid systematically on each side of the panel, creating a Votox-like pattern reminiscent of pages from classical Islamic calligraphy. The two panels, each carrying its own argument, are visually identical and deceiving the viewer about its content. This visual deception enforces the viewer to look at the text as an image and reminds us that the reading of the written word is in fact always an interpretation. <clears throat> uh, I am my lost diamond, uh, circa 2011. Uh, this was originally installed at the Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati um, in 2011. Um, so the dimension of this piece are variable. Uh, in this original site, it is installed on a 70 feet long wall. And here's another view of that wall. And this was, uh, you know, Contemporary Art Center was basically, the, I think, uh, uh, the famous architect Zaha Hadid, her first work in the United States. So it was a very uh, different kind of space that I had ever worked on before. A very industrial look, huge. Um, I wasn't used to before working in a space like that because, you know, when you make miniatures, you're always working in a small um, sort of a format and holding the painting in your hands. Uh, it's a very intimate uh, process. So uh, that was quite an, um, you know, eye-opening in, you know, in many ways um, for me. And um, these are all resin casted little fingers and toes that are pinned and all glued on a flat surface of the wall. Uh, the piece was made in response to the news uh, of a friend who was visiting Pakistan and uh, who narrowly escaped a suicide attack, leaving me to think about the precariousness and fragility of human body and how it is often taken for granted by its own caretakers. Uh, the same body that is capable of crafting the toys for mass destruction is the body that is the most vulnerable to its own wrath. Here is a detail close up. I don't know if you can recognize, but you know, the shapes, uh, these are all uh, fingers and toes. So uh, it, the piece is dirty and pretty at the same time. And when seen from a distance, uh, it appears as a burst of rose petals uh, or explosion of celebratory fireworks. Uh, but up close, it evokes a visceral kind of reaction that one can feel in one's own fingers and toes. Uh, you have to experience it in person to uh, it. Uh, the, the screen doesn't really give you much information. And here is uh, another version of the I Am My Last Diamond. I chose to make a rug out of uh, that. It's sort of like, uh, you know, the small bits of these, um, um, uh, you know, the digits or the fingers and toes, they kind of worked. Uh, I always, I use them as my, you know, tool to make marks. And it's sort of like, you know, I weave the rug by, um, um, you know, placing them together. And then when they're casted, I also cast them in multiple colors. Like, you know, I would add, it's a very, even though it's a sculpture, but it, the process is very much like a painting, you know, like how we mix our pigments together. So the, you know, the pigments are mixed in resin. It's a feather light, feather light resin that I've used. Um, and, um, uh, you know, first the mold is uh, made from um, a human, with a human hand, and then, then it's processed, you know, I 
uh, kind of make another mold out of it, but cast it and make another mold out of it with just a section of it, you know, the section that I want uh, sort of, you know, it's sort of like a mark. So, uh, and then uh, tons and tons of molds are made, you know, there's a mother mold and then there's a made and, uh, and then they're cast. So there are hundreds and thousands of these uh, pieces that are put together uh, to, to create uh, the final piece and it all gets installed on site. Um, um, this is a $1 bill uh, from the series In God We Trust. Uh, this was also done in uh, 2012. Um, this series was uh, a set of large scale drawings uh, which are almost seven feet long, uh, done on a tea stained paper with actual shredded dollar bills. Um, it refers to the, the value of uh, paper money in the capitalist world. Uh, being an artist whose work primarily is set um, on a surface of paper, uh, the paper has tremendous value uh, for me, uh, for the labor of love that it involves. Um, you know, the paper is not uh, a piece of paper for me, it, you know, especially after it bears hundreds of hours of labor uh, in the form of uh, meditative mark making. It is an object of significant uh, uh, preciousness. Uh, so my work involved uh, in this series is assigning the value to something that has been devalued by its own makers. Um, so for instance, if tomorrow somebody tells me, you can go to any store and pick, uh, pick anything you want, uh, then suddenly the, the paper money becomes useless and uh, its value you know, comes down to its basic, uh, um, to being just a big piece of paper. So in God, we tr uh, trust plays with these kind of notions and um, uh, the money that was devalued by the Department of Treasury uh, uh, by way of shedding it uh, uh, into, the, into small bits is used and rearranged one bit by bit to create a giant uh, dollar bill. Um, all right, so um, it was a lot of work, by the way. <laughs> so I've done only three uh, bills so far, uh, the one being the first one and five and dollar ten. And uh, just because that is the only tool that, you know, I'm using, it's uh, to make my drawing. Uh, again, you know, it's done on a tea stained, you know, paper is tea stained. And then just picking through the the devalued uh, you know currency through them you know the it the printed currency you know the areas that are printed with the darker ink becomes the darker value of, for drawing for me and then you know just taking one piece of time and putting it together. How how, how big were those dollar bills? Because it seems really large. Yeah, that's almost seven feet long. Okay. So um, uh, these small 3D digits uh, were made from the marks drawn in my sketch pad. And uh, they are recognized as different letters from Arabic language or Urdu language because we use the same script. Uh, these letters um, or marks uh, were turned into 3D forms by making molds and then casting them in multiple colors. Uh, the small pieces were used uh, as a drawing tool in crafting an image resembling traditional uh, Kashikari patterns from Pakistani ceramic and tile art. So uh, this large work was commissioned by the State Department for the U.S. Embassy in Pakistan. And uh, it is, the whole piece is actually, it's uh, 80 feet long installation uh, that began uh, with small marks on a piece of paper in my studio. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, playfulness with the scale in this work. Um, I, everything was done in my studio from making of the panel, you know, from, you know, we just go to lumber, get a wood, make a panel, paint it, and then, uh, and from the drawing to transferring it into a 3D format, like, you know, in different uh, textures like wood or, uh, a plastic and then molds are made out of that. And then once the molds are made, 
then you cast them in multiple colors by adding pigments into into resin of a different color. So Kashikiri patterns usually have a lot of blue uh, colors, uh, shades of blue. So it's one of the most uh, dominant um, color in um, in this installation. So uh, um, I actually never uh, got to see the whole work while I was working uh, in the studio because I didn't have a big enough wall. I, the largest wall I had in my studio was 20 feet. So I saw it in bits, you know, and, uh, um, but I got to see it while, you know, it was being installed in, in the embassy. So here you can see, you know, this is one section of the wall uh, in you know, relevance to our own size. So, um, and um, so each and individual uh, piece uh, was casted and uh, then glued on panel. You know, for you know, once it's casted, then you know it's glued on panel. Uh, from a distance, it appeared as one big pattern, uh, but when close, the smaller pieces are recognized as different letters from the language. So. Uh, for you, maybe you'll be able to see it as a pattern, a design, a mark, but a person who can actually uh, understand the language, you know, they can recognize all these letters from, uh, from the language. And uh, it was an interesting, uh, you know, this was a whole process, like a year long process. I had to go and see the site first. Uh, and since it was a government um, a commission project, uh, so there's not much, you know, generally, usually like, my work is loaded with uh, social political issues. So we were pretty limited in what we could do um, with our, you know, with the work. But I think it was very befitting for the place because it resonated what exists, uh, you know, in uh, outside um, of that uh, big building. Uh, you know, I picked something that was part of that culture and practice on a re uh, regular basis and an everyday basis. And um, so that is a permanently um, installed piece there. So now um, coming back to the works that are uh, in the background, uh, you can see not this one, but it's from the same series. I, 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 are we on track on time? It's just, I'm not sure how much uh, time I'm using. Okay, so I'm good. We're doing fine. Okay. Uh, so the series is called uh, Say My Name. And um, it uh, this is, was done in 2019, uh, and I had already been working on 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 this series before. You know, it takes a long time for me to um, make one piece of art because there's a lot of research involved, and uh, so I had already been working for you know a couple of years prior to that and uh, collecting references, and then uh, by the time it, you know I start to actually make the work, you know. It is already half of the work is already done, and so uh, this one was done in two, 2019, and um, uh, it's a, a, a series which is dedicated to the young casualties of U.S. Uh, drone strikes in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Um, so each work displays uh, shredded pieces of paper in uh, varied patterns. Uh, the shredded pieces uh, repeat the name and age of a single victim. Uh, for instance, in uh, this is Aisha Three, a young victim whose name was uh, Aisha and who was uh, three years old at the time the drone uh, striked and ended her life. So her name has been written on a piece of paper over and over again and then shredded. Uh, the shredded pieces were then glued on a tea stained surface, uh, one mark at a time. Um, similarly, uh, in this drawing, Elias uh, uh, 13, so this kid who was 13 years old, name was Elias, uh, a dragon is seen uh, with its mouth wide open as if to annihilate the shredded name of the victim. Uh, there is a contrast between the apparent beauty of the image and the horrid reality of political violence. I wanted to uh, show some of the the surfaces that uh, these uh, the smart making happens. So uh, you know this is just you know when I'm staining my paper, I'm already halfway through my work because there's a lot of uh, uh, the before the ideas evolve. There's a lot of research that uh, is done on that. 
So, you know, it's the same size, you know, the drawings behind you, they're I think 22 by 30 inches uh, unframed. And uh, it's a technique of staining the paper that I learned when I was uh, learning traditional Indian and Persian miniature painting. So we used to make Vasli, which was a traditional paper uh, uh, for miniature painting. And, uh, you know, we, you burnish the surface and then uh, you um, either stain it with tea or, you know, just start working directly on it. So, uh, so it has been my, a part of my, my practice since I, you know, there's a lot of, it's very therapeutic also just cooking the tea first and then letting it sit for, depending on how long it sits, so the longer it sits, the darker it becomes. And, and also you learn, you know, we are, I'm a treating tea drinker so uh what kind of tea gets you what kind of a color so um definitely not the tea bags so loose tea is really really good so here uh you know this for instance this went through several layers you know it takes days to uh to build up a surface like that and um uh, you know you make a mark and then you have to wait for it to dry it's like you know you working with oil painting you make your mark and you wait for it to dry so that you can put another mark on it. So that's how it's been uh, built. Um, right, so uh, here's another piece. Uh, this uh, is also, I think, from 2019. Uh, it's uh, called Muhammad Yunus, 16, uh, just uh, the child was 16 years old. Uh, so each of these drawings have been uh, executed with great care and immense uh, beauty. The goal uh, has been to make them as beautiful as possible. Um, since the content of the series has to do with death and violence, and it is the ultimate ugly reality. Uh, so we, you know, so my challenge uh, here has been in crafting uh, them in such a way that they portray the, the opposite when encountered by the human eye. Uh, so beauty and aesthetics have been part of my uh, work, uh, especially when dealing with uh, such dark topics. Uh, it is a foil uh, that the subject matter is wrapped in while presenting it to the world. Uh, you know, because we, th I think we live in a time when uh, entertainment is the solution for all our problems. It takes us away from the real um, imperfect life uh, to the world where everything is perfect. Uh, so how could one use art to redirect the viewer from the deception to reality? So I think by using deception as a tool to lure the viewer into the reality. Um, so I use beauty and aesthetics uh, to direct the audience to the things that uh, matters. Uh, uh, I think, uh, you know, the U.S. war on terror and the damage it has caused in the world, especially in the Muslim world, since uh, September 11th attacks, um, from Muslim ban to the killing of the innocent via drone strikes, uh, it is something that has to be uh, talked much about. It is something uh, <clears throat> that needs to be looked into by its citizens. Um, uh, so... In this piece, the blood sucking mosquitoes are seen uh, filling up their bellies by uh, sucking up on the bits of sheds of the victim's name. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of color, you know, in, the, in this uh, series. And there's a lot of, um, um, you know, it seems very gestural, but when you come close, you know, it's very controlled, you know, the gestures from, you know, from, from a distance, it looks, you know, it has, it's very fluid and it's very organic. But when you come close, you know, they are very, um, kind of very controlled one mark at a time. And um, uh, this is, I'm sorry, this one's called Shweb 8, you know, the child who's eight, uh, eight years old. Uh, this is called unknown or namalum. It's number two. I did a several of these uh, unknowns. Um, so a person's name uh, is the first thing that is given to him or her as part of their identity when they're born. So writing their name and uh, and then shredding it symbolizes how their identities have been rejected or erased. Um, uh, in this uh, political violence, uh, so many victims did not even have a name. 
So they are called namalum or unknown, or that's how you know they've been recorded in in the database. Uh, uh, these unknown must have been very dear and precious to someone that uh, we don't know, and there's really so much that we don't know. Um, so I chose to use black that refers to the unknown in uh, many of my drawings. Uh, in this work, uh, you see a word namalum or the unknown written in black on the black paper that is almost hard to identify even with the naked eye. So I don't know if you were able to spot it when you, uh, in, uh, when you saw the work in, behind you, uh, but you really have to look for it um, uh, to see it. But they are there and, and you can see them uh, because I've been also improvising the way the black text goes on top of the black uh, surface, you know, how the mark has to be done in a way for it to be also kind of be subtly visible uh, to the eye. Uh, so here's a detail of um, uh, that piece looking at the time at the same time, I think I should just move faster. Uh, it's just a few, few drawings left, slides left. Um, um, and, uh, and this is also Namalum 4. Uh, you know, I've just numbered them because we, we, we don't have a record of what uh, the age and the name of the, the victim was. So they are just uh, unknown. And uh, here is a detail and you could see, you know, it starts with a mark. I draw a mark on a piece of paper and then that mark, uh, you know, once the name is written on a piece of paper, it uh, is uh, actually cut in the shape of the mark that I make. And then those shapes are, you know, glued on, on the surface. Uh, so here I've also used a lot of uh, gold leaf and um, so sort of the, contrary to uh, each other in a way that the black refers to darkness and you know the unknown and the gold refers to light and brightness and something that is precious. So uh, something that may be unknown and you know had something has no value to us may be very precious to somebody else. Um, uh, this is called Khalid uh, 12 and um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's hard to kind of see, um, you know, what the drawing goes through in the several layers of its making. Uh, bring a drawing, uh, a close up. So um, uh, there's a lot of play, uh, a texture in the work too, um, uh, with very in a very subtle kind of manner. Um, the texture of the ripped piece of of text and it has its own texture and then yet the the lines uh the written word or the written name uh kind of appear you know adds into that um you know a depth as a depth into the work which is very two-dimensional um and um so this is probably the closest i could get to show you how the surface be before the marks went on it uh, it went through all these different stages of uh, preparation. Uh, the surface, it has a, a deconstructed a name of the child, Khalid, uh, uh, engraved on, on this, uh, this. You can probably see some of the, the, the different in the detail or not, maybe not. And then tea stained and then the marks are on it. So it's sort of, you know, and then I, sometimes I use these, uh, can't help image because I was trained to think in images, you know, no matter what I do, they just keep showing up in the work. And uh, this image of this lone single, you know, a small boat, you know, it's been caught up in the middle of the storm. Uh, you know, it just kind of made me think of those uh, children who are caught up in this uh, war on terror in the middle of some, you know, the the political uh, you know, crisis uh, and um, not knowing, you know, you know, why they're there and what, you know, whatever happened to them. So um, uh, this is Razi Muhammad and 16. And um, I don't know if there's anything I need to talk much about that. 
it's just um, this is Asadullah nine. Um, And uh, here's a detail. And um, this one, I'm not sure. I forgot the name of this title of this one. The detail of that. Uh, this is very large drawing in a uh, triptych format. Uh, the family of three was uh, documentary, documented as a victim of drone strikes by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Uh, now the words wife and son of Badr Mansoor, uh, this is what it is called. The title is wife and son of Badr Mansoor. It is apparent that uh, the ones who got killed were the wife and son or Badr Mansoor, uh, or his family did not release the name of their family members uh, for privacy uh, who had been killed in, 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 the, in these st the strikes. So although Badr Mansoor uh, lived, he is equally a victim of this political violence. So I chose to do a triptych representing each person in a unified frame. And uh, you can probably see that in your, in your through your uh, camera and behind Benito. Um, uh, so I chose the, the text to be in a form of a drop, uh, like a blood when it is red and a tear when it is white or black. The actual drawing process starts with the formation of the text. So these and again also marks that I, you know, uh, drew on my uh, drawing paper and then they've been cut into the shape of the mark that I drew and then they are uh, glued on. And there's a variation in uh, um, the color, uh, you know, the, the darkest kind of being the, you know, the dried blood, you know, the old and the dried blood and the lightest being the, you know, the fresh. And um, this last piece, it's, uh, it's actually, it's called, it is called Say My Name. And this piece, I was already working on this idea before I made all these drawings, but this piece was actually realized uh, I think 2018 or 2019 after I'd started the series. Uh, this um, is a lithograph. Um, you know, it was uh, done in collaboration with the Landfall Press in, New, uh, in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, it's a diptych uh, format with a multiple uh, plates and uh, the image has been crafted in the format of an open page of a book, uh, like some of the earlier pieces that I showed you. So each panel is carrying the deconstructed name of the victims of, of the violence, political violence. Uh, on the right, uh, as we look at the screen on the right, uh, are the names and ages of the young victims of gun violence from uh, Sandy Hook shooting. And on the left are the victims of US drone strikes. So uh, for me, uh, they both kind of, it's similar, you know, there's, I don't find anything different in them because they, the victims are all children and they're all uh, a result of, uh, you know, the, the decisions, the political decisions that are, are, are being made. Um, so, uh, so I call this Say My Name, and then that actually gave birth to the whole series, but this was realized later on in, um, after I'd already started working. And um, I think that's about it. I don't know about maybe I've taken too much time. Uh, we still have like 10 minutes for question and answers, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Sure, uh, we, we do have some questions. Um, let me, um, I'm gonna have to, Get my glasses out for this one because uh, the font size on the iPad is really small. Should I uh, uh, close this? Yeah, you screen? can close that. Um, right now. Is it gone? Yeah. Um, so one of the questions is asked is, um, uh, in the one where you use fingers and toes uh, mm -hmm. that you cast, uh, uh, whose were they, and or were they were they your own, or were they multiple people? They were multiple people, and it happened uh, over a period of time. You know, it's not was one time, 
And I used to like, you know, people would visit me in the studio and I'll say, oh, hey, you know, can I, can I take it, take, uh, take a little bit of piece of your finger. So they'll just, you know, I'll make a mold right there because the materials we use, it, it's just very uh, silicon. It's very, uh, it's not, it doesn't take long time. And uh, then this, the studio that I had was in uh, back in Lexington, Massachusetts. It was actually in a building, an old school building. And so they were uh, uh, on the first floor, there were a lot of like these after school uh, programs. So the children used to come to my studio for visit sometimes, you know, and uh, one day they came and I asked them and they all wanted to be part of that. Uh, so I casted theirs and, you know, it has mine, my assistants, you know, and actually some, uh, some curators, Justine's fingers there too. <laughs> and, uh, you know, different curators, people who came to revisit. And sometimes I, I just, just didn't take my materials to people, but people who ever came to my studio, and said, yeah, they all. Uh, the next one is actually a comment. It's uh, all of your works are so beautiful and meaningful and important. Uh, thank you so much for sharing. I am especially deeply moved by your Say Your Name series. Thank you. Um, the next one is um, thinking of your public installation in Pakistan. I'm wondering if you could imagine a public space in the U.S. or even in Texas where you would want to feature a work that reflects your life here. Sure. I mean, if I have the opportunity, uh, yes, why not? So I did a, an installation for uh, Dallas Contemporary a few years ago, but it was an indoor installation. Um, but yes, if there's an uh, opportunity, if some, you know, um, I'm all, all for it. <laughs> why not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and actually, it just turns out that was from a friend of yours, Leah McCurdy here at GTA. Oh. So. Okay. Uh, the next one is, uh, I recognize that paper shred shredders are potentially just as effective tools here, but does your use of paper shredders in preparing collage materials point to destroying the evidence? So it does, but uh, uh, this is how it started, you know, the whole thing with the, you know, shredding or you know, we, before we had shredders, we, we used to rip, you know, when we didn't want something we wanted to reject, we would just tear it off, old letters, old journals. And that's how it started. I started, you know, I, it was actually back in my grad uh, school year in, in the late nineties, when I actually took out my old journals and I just ripped them because I just, you know, but I would read them and I said, that's not me because, you know, you've grown and then, you know, it doesn't relate with you, but you don't want to discard it because this is part of yourself. So I wanted I, to transform it into something that was present at the time that when I was thinking, so I ripped them and then I glued the pieces onto a piece of uh, board, uh, kind of, you know, so the words were not visible, but it, they're still there. And I have still have some of those pieces from, you know, um, in my studio <laughs> from yeah. that, uh, that time. Uh, but I also have to say that not all of my pieces are shredded, you know, some of them are hand cut, uh, some, and like the latest one were this, uh, the one behind you, the red one, um, uh, wife and son of Badr Mansur, they, they, those, they, those are laser cut. And that, cutting a small piece like that, even with the laser cut, it's not, you know, you know how long it takes. Right. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, for me, you know, this may seem like a very in, insane process. Like why would, would she do something like that, mm -hmm. you know? For me, I think it's very, it's very cathartic. It's very, uh, it's sort of like the whole process is, you know, it's like the, the bearer of the clarity of my mind, you know, with the, the kind of uh, topics and the issues that I choose to uh, do, it needs a lot of clarity. So something, you know, something very kind of ritualistic, you know, in a way it, it just kind of helps that way to, clear up my thoughts about it. <laughs> uh, one of the things that's unfortunate, you mentioned earlier in the pieces where you collage, and especially the pieces kind of like right over my left shoulder over here, that the, the collage is not only just collage on paper, it's like collage on collage on collage on paper. 
So they, they create a really uh, quite a bit of depth to the work that to me is like when you first see the work, even live, you don't get that, uh, the idea of what's actually going on until you get closer. And when you get closer, they also seem to become even more richer for that reason. And I know that it takes that kind of work, takes a lot of uh, time and effort, but it really pays off in the end because I think they the, the become just very exquisite in, in, the, in the textural um, aspects of the, of the work, aside from the, the content and, and the overall look. But it's just, it, I think, you know, I, I think that's one of the things I really enjoy about the work being here is being able to see the work and actually study it, you know, more closely. I know almost, uh, I don't do this every day, but because I work here, <laughs> I'm able to see it quite often. And the prints themselves are really beautiful prints. Uh, and in, in some cases, there's that one uh, where the woman in the, the burkas and, and the, and the um, bamboo sticks. I mean, that from a distance, that's also kind of looks like a, a abstract work. And that's one of the things that we were talking about earlier in, in the recent work or the work that's behind me is uh, a little bit more abstract, even though it has figurative elements. But and then the prints are a little bit more figurative um can can you kind of you, you talked about the idea of going back and forth yes so those works are quite uh, you know works i actually started my presentation from that time they are earlier works and uh, i actually was known for uh you know for making a figurative work take you know I, that's what i was trained in you know and always uh miniature painting you know you can't not have a figure right so um uh and I, the process is so intense that this is how, you know, I used to think in images before I would actually could put it into words, I would think in Im images. But slowly, I think I also found multiple venues through the process that, that I could actually expand in. And mark making was one, which was also, you know, part of the, the techniques that we learned you know, the technique of making marks in miniature painting, it's called pardakh. It's a small mark that you make with a brush and the brush is so small, it can barely hold any ink in it. But uh, so when you make a marsh, mark, it's not visible. So you have to do it several times, you know, and mm -hmm. after several layers, then you're able to see one mark. And that's how the paintings are built. And uh, that has actually led me to, you know, like, like how can you make a mark that would make sense for you for what you're doing right now and the times you're living in and and how you know like to push the about the the boundaries uh, of mark making and uh, so i kind of moved into that direction and it's just been i kind of fell in love with that and and i thought the whole purpose of that figure had i had already served that i had done a lot of works uh, based on the the female protagonist that i that I introduced in uh, in this genre because uh, she had always been through, seen or presented through the gaze of a male artist in and miniature painting. So I, uh, you know, I felt there was a need. Somebody has to do it, so I did it, and I think I'm past that now. <laughs> so and there are more uh, venues to to look into. If I have to do it again, if I feel like it, I'll probably. But right now, I'm completely in a different. Um, frame of mind you know but the figure is always there you know maybe not visually but you know the presence is still there well even in the pieces that are almost completely abstract but the, the name of the persons there that keeps it figurative in a sense mm -hmm. in another manner yeah you know. anyway uh, that's about our time I, I want to thank you Ambreen for sharing your work with us yeah. and um for having and, me. and I hope that uh, people uh, get to see the show. The show ends this Saturday. Yes. Uh, we will have a virtual exhibition of the actual exhibition that we're trying to get up on our uh, universe, our UTA Art and Art History Department website. So um, once the exhibition is down, you will be able to see the virtual exhibition uh, for the next few months. Also, we will have a recording of this uh, YouTube event and we'll have that link on our website as well. So if you, if you end up missing this, and I assume you haven't because you're actually hearing this, uh, that you'll be able to see this uh, later on. And so I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. 
And I hope that you all have a good day. And, and again, be sure to come by and see the show. The Bill Viola piece is also, um, it's a video installation. It's an, an incredible piece. Uh, and it's um, uh, only here for, again, with the show until Saturday, uh, April 8th, uh, April 3rd. So thank you very much and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining.